And our first speaker today is Dr. Eva Zabo. She uh, graduated from Yale University with a bachelor's degree in molecular biophysics and biochemistry. Wow. <laughs> Impressive. Things you don't know about me. <laughs> and then she got her MD degree from Duke University. My daughter went to Duke as an undergrad. <laughs> Familiar places. And then she did her uh, internal medicine residency in New York at a medical center. She uh, then came to NCI and currently uh, she's chief of the lung and upper aerodigestive cancer research group in the division of cancer prevention. And she's going to talk to us about non-small cell lung cancer. Okay, can everybody hear me? Well, I think maybe this works a little bit better. That's fine. Okay, so uh, thank you, Terry, uh, for my repeat uh, yearly, how many years in a row is this? So I'm gonna be talking to you about non-small cell lung cancer, um, diagnosis, treatment, and then about half of this is going to be about prevention and early detection, which I think you don't get at any other lecture. Certainly not about lung cancer. So just, and I know that you had the small cell lecture fairly recently, um, so I'm going to go through this fairly briefly. These are the lung cancer statistics for this year, estimated statistics from the American Cancer Society. Over 230,000 new cases, almost 159,000 deaths. This is the leading cause of cancer deaths greater than in America greater than the next three causes of cancer death put together. Now, the good news is that the death rate for, uh, has been decreasing. Uh, it's almost 30%, 20% less than it was back um, 25 years ago. Um, and finally, we're seeing those benefits for women as well as for men. But the bad news is that the absolute number of cases continues to go up as we have an aging population and their survival all diagnoses of non-small cell lung cancer, actually of all uh, lung cancer in general, remains very dismal. 5% in the 1950s, 66 years later, we're up to a whopping 16%. So this, is, this remains a major, major problem. So the risk factors you probably know, um, it's tobacco and more tobacco and yet more tobacco, that's 85% of all lung cancer. Um, this includes passive smoking, so those who live with people who smoke a lot. Additional risk factors are a prior air digestive malignancy, like a head and neck cancer, although a lot of this is probably due to the shared tobacco exposure. Um, and um, emphysema, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which again, a lot of this is through the shared exposure to tobacco, but there are some non-tobacco associated forms of COPD, and those too are associated with increased uh, risk of lung cancer. So it's in addition to uh, what you get from tobacco. I love this picture because it tells you all you need to know about lung cancer. Here's the tumor. Here are the changes. You see some fibrosis, some bully from COPD, and here's your pack of cigarettes. Okay, and that's what you need to know about lung cancer. Actually, there's more. So other exposures that are important, uh, you may be aware of asbestos. Um, people think of asbestos and mesothelioma, but in fact, the most common cancer after asbestos exposure is lung cancer. Not to say that there isn't the meso uh, association, but there's just um, lung cancer is so much more common and often because asbestos and tobacco exposure go hand in hand. Radon, various industrial uh, exposures, um, you know, arsenic, mining, shipbuilding, et cetera. And there are some genetic predispositions. Um, this is a little bit difficult to study because people who live in households with smokers not only share their genes, they share the exposures, right? But there are some familial syndromes relatively rare. There's a germline mutation in the epidermal growth factor receptor. This is a specific mutation, the T790M. 
which uh, occurs quite rarely. We'll talk about EGFR in a little bit. There are um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunits that certain uh, SNPs are uh, associated with increased risk of smoking and of lung cancer, and actually that's a susceptibility locus for COPD as well. But by and large, it's environmental exposures or environmental exposures adding on to um, various uh, genetic predispositions. Quick uh, review of pathology. Um, so this is a lecture on non-small cell. That's what I'm going to be talking about more from now on. Adenocarcinomas are the most common form of lung cancer, but of non-small cell lung cancer, about 40% of all cases. They tend to be peripheral, um, and are typical adenomatous, uh, have typical adenomatous features. Squamous cell used to be the most common. It's now only about 20% of cases. These tend to be more centrally located, the larger airways, and have their own typical features. Both of these are actually associated with tobacco exposure, although a subgroup of adenocarcinomas are not associated with tobacco exposure. Large cells are a little bit uncommon, about 50% of all cases. Uh, they can be peripheral, um, they can have neuroendocrine features, and then there's a small smattering of malignant carcinoids, sarcomas. These are all relatively rare cancers. So when we talk about non-small cell lung cancer, the vast majority is really the adenos and the squamous cell carcinomas. And just a uh, review from um, a couple of weeks ago, Small cell makes up about 20%, tends to be a uh, central tumor, extremely aggressive, but also uh, more chemoresponsive than non-small cell. And that's it for small cell. You won't hear me talk about it from now on. So it turns out that this lengthy exposure to tobacco leads to a lengthy evolution of lung cancer. Most people start smoking when they're in their teens. Most people don't develop lung cancer tobacco-associated lung cancer, until they're in their late 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, all these years. And that's because you have this progressive accumulation of histologic and molecular changes th going through this hyperplasia, metaplasia, increasing uh, grades of dysplasia, all the way through invasive cancer. And this gives us an opportunity to treat, once you have the cancer, but not cure, maybe detect earlier, and at the very end of my lecture, I'll talk a little bit about early detection because that has definitely gotten new life and is one of the more exciting things that has uh, happened in the last five or six years. Or during this lengthy process of development of cancer for prevention, and I'll talk about that as well and how we're trying to prevent non-small cell lung cancer. But I'm gonna start with the easy, root uh, treatment. I'm a medical oncologist by training. Um, and it's very uh, anatomically driven. Early stages, surgery, local uh, progression with lymph nodes, surgery plus adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Once you have more distant regional spread through the mediastinum, the center of the chest, now you're talking combined modality treatments, chemoradiation, sometimes with the addition of surgery, if the lymph nodes are on the same side of the mediastinum as the tumor itself. But once you get to metastatic disease, whether it be what we call 3B wet by the old terminology, in other words, pleural effusion, uh, which means that there are tumor, there's tumor seeding to the pleural lining, or distant metastases, stage four, then you're really talking about systemic therapies. This is not a curable situation as of today, although lots of enthusiasm and hope that uh, maybe we're gonna get there pretty soon. We also use radiation as needed for local control. Occasionally, we resect isolated metastases, such as those in the brain, um, but by and large, this is not a curable situation. However, there's been major evolution of how we treat lung cancer. So, Terry uh, didn't tell you when I did my uh, oncology training here. It was actually um, in the early 90s, uh, 89 onward. And there, at that point, everybody got chemotherapy, small cell got aggressive certain regimens, 
everything else was non-small cell. It was defined by the fact that it wasn't small cell and everybody got chemotherapy, didn't respond to it well, and you know, may, lived for six to eight months. But with our understanding now of all the genetic abnormalities um, that uh, lead to the evolution of various subtypes of non-small cell lung cancer, we now have a completely different treatment paradigm. And so this is one chart, a pie chart, that they change rapidly, showing the targetable mutations, the abnormalities, uh, some of which actually have drugs associated with them that can explain uh, the driver mutations that occur in the evolution of lung cancer. And you see here the epidermal growth factor receptor, KRAS, which is not currently uh, targetable, and then smaller percentages of a variety of other driver abnormalities, um, some of which can be targeted. So the poster child of precision medicine of targetable mutations is the epidermal growth factor receptor. Um, this is uh, one of the first uh, uh, examples of precision medicine in oncology. Uh, it occurs in maybe 10 to 15 percent of all tumors, but a much higher percentage of people who never smoked. And when there are specific EGFR mutations, um, the response rates with uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, specific targeted drugs, are tremendous, 60 to 80 percent. The progression-free survival, in other words, before you need to switch to a different treatment, is our, on the order of 10 to 14 months. With chemotherapy, it's closer to four months. At that point, chemo stops working. And the median survival is on the order of two to two and a half years. Okay, um, so this marks a huge change in how we treat people. In fact, now, erlotinib, but also two other drugs, efatinib and gefitinib, are approved for frontline treatment, so people don't go directly to chemo if they have an EGFR mutation. They can receive one of these uh, three drugs. Also, for second-line treatment, if they happen to get chemo and then are found to have a mutation, then it's just as effective, second line or third line, maintenance. So this is really a huge change um, in how we treat um, EGFR mutant portion of uh, non-small cell. We now know some of the mechanisms of resistance. About half of people who um, uh, progress after, for instance, erlotinib, will have the specific mutation, the T790M mutation. And this is now targetable with yet another drug, osimertinib, which was approved recently um, and gives you the same kind of responses as erlotinib did frontline. So you can now salvage about half the people who progress after the frontline TKIs, and you can salvage them for another 10 plus months with osimertinib. Um, so this is, again, a huge change. If you have, you may recognize this T790M. This is what I told you was part of the genetic syndrome. Small percentage, less than 1% of never smokers who have lung cancer um, actually have this germline mutation. And in that case, they don't respond to erlotinib, the um, frontline drugs but they actually do tend to respond to OC. Those studies are underway, um, but in any case, so huge change, C change. Another um, molecular abnormality, which is um, a target for treatment, is the EML4 ALK fusion gene. Um, this is the poster child for rapid drug development. Um, this occurs in maybe 5% of uh, non-small cells, again, mainly never smokers, so it's not as common as EGFR mutations. But the responses to specific inhibitors, crizotinib is the first of these, are just as uh, high, about 60% response rate. The majority of the rest of the folks have at least stable disease for some period of time. We now have second-line drugs. Um, 
um, again, about a 50 to 60 percent response rate. Two different drugs have been approved. Um, this situation is a little bit more complex when there's resistance than the EGFR story, because instead of having one main mechanism or most common mechanism of progression, there are many, many different ones. Um, and for some of them, ceritinib is better. For others, electinib is better. So um, what people often do is now do a second biopsy after progression to try to predict what's the best way to move forward. And you can imagine that you keep on biopsying people who have lesions elsewhere. Not only is it expensive, it's actually quite difficult. Um, takes a lot out of the patient. Um, but that's sort of where we are right now as the cell-free DNA technologies are taking off, and that's going to be the future. ROS1 is yet another rearrangement. Now we're down to about 1.5% uh, 1, 1 of all non-small cells. Again, this is an example of uh, a um, abnormality that occurs, again, mainly in never smokers. And you see this is pretreatment. This is looking straight on to the chest. Um, and you see all this white stuff. White is bad on a CT scan. Gone here. And so crizotinib, same drug as used for ALK rearrangements, um, has a very high response rate and actually quite a lengthy median duration of response. And then there are others, and they become less and less frequent, per to new, RAF, RET. The point is that at this, uh, you, you need to find many different abnormalities. These are all tissue-based tests. You need to see whether the, this abnormality is in the lung cancer or metastases. Um, and so um, you can see the cost balloon, the complexity balloon, but um, actual some beautiful responses. So for the people who have these mutations, if they can be identified, makes a big difference. For squamous cell carcinoma, we know a lot less, and there are many fewer um, uh, genetic driver mutations, um, and none of them right now can be targeted with approved therapies. One relatively common one, 22% or 20% of squamous cells, is the fibrobl fibroblast growth factor receptor 1 amplification. There are drugs that are being developed. Another one in about 4% of squamous cells is this DDR2 mutation some of which, uh, some of these appear to be sensitive, at least in vitro, and the studies are ongoing in vivo to, for instance, desatinib, which is used for chronic myelogenous leukemia. So there's a lot of work ongoing, but huge complexity. What is the next uh, game changer is, of course, immunotherapy. I'm, I'm assuming that you will have a lecture where this is uh, discussed much further. Immunotherapy uh, is, has now actually reached the level of approved and even frontline treatment appro approvals. Um, and it's uh, right now for lung cancer, non small cell, it's limited to um, targeting the program DEATH1 receptor, PD1, which is a co inhibitory receptor, T cell co inhibitory receptor receptor that regulates T-cell activation. Actually, what it does is that it limits T-cell activation as a, a response during the inflammatory response to infection uh, to limit autoimmunity. But tumors frequently uh, um, upregulate the ligand for this receptor, PDL1, and blockade of this interaction potentiates the immune response. And this is now approved therapy for lung cancer, also for melanoma. So anti-PD-1 and or PD-L1 antibodies are now approved for second-line treatment of non-small cell. There are three of them altogether. Um, this one and this one are approved for anybody. Pembrolizumab is only approved for people whose tumors express PD-L1 at least at the 1% level. And these antibodies, again, are game changers. The response rate is a little bit higher than standard 
second line chemotherapy. Um, but what you see is a long, for those who respond, um, there is a fairly long-term response rate. Uh, the medium duration of the response is 12.5 months with pembrolizumab compared to about three months with chemotherapy. And you start seeing curves that look like this, where if you go out after a year or two years, there seems to be this long tail, which never happened with chemotherapy. So in other words, there are people who are two, three years out. It's the minority, but nevertheless, you know, when you start seeing people with disseminated non-small cell lung cancer who are alive and stable two or three years out, you're saying, can we think about the C word, the cure word? So this is where the field is going. Now this actual chart, um, graph is from the pembrolizumab frontline treatment. So uh, this is about a third of people have greater than 50% PDL1 expression in their tumors. And this drug was just approved because of the progression-free survival. That's about 10 months compared to chemo six months. Um, and this long-term survivor. So this is where the field is going, trying to figure out the best way to use these drugs, when to use them, how to combine them with other drugs, with chemotherapy, et cetera. Okay, and that's where I'm gonna stop with um, treatment. So how do we actually reduce the tremendous morbidity and mortality due to non-small cell? Three modalities. Talk to you about the therapeutics which again, as exciting as immunotherapy is, it's not for everybody, and we don't know whether it will ever cure anybody. We're hopeful that it will. The other two modalities that we can use or approaches that we can use are prevention and early detection, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this um, lecture. So if 85% of the um, non-small cell or lung cancer is caused by um, smoking, can't you just stop smoking? Well, if you ever talk to a smoker, you'll know how difficult it is. But it's more complicated than that. So this is a study called the Lung Health Study, which was actually a COPD trial where they gave people inhalers and various modalities trying to improve their uh, long-term survival from um, COPD. A lot of those people, because they were smokers, um, actually uh, died of lung cancer. So this is the rate of death per, per 1,000 person years. And what you see here is that if a person continued smoking at a 15 year, 14.5 year follow up, you know, they had a, a rate of death of three per 1,000 person years. If they stopped smoking, the uh, death rate was half of that. And if they smoked on and off intermittent qu quitters, their death rate was somewhere in between. Now, what's important about this is that if you plot the same graph, okay, after five years of uh, smoking cessation, there's no difference between those who quit smoking versus those who continue to smoke in terms of their death rate from lung cancer. So to get the benefit, you really need to look long term which is not to say that people shouldn't quit smoking, quite the opposite, but you're not gonna see the benefit in the first year or two after they stop smoking. You will see their cardiovascular benefit. You'll see that their uh, lungs are healthier and they don't continue to destroy uh, their lungs with emphysema, but they're not gonna stop dying at the same rate as those who continue to smoking until you're more than 10 years out. And that's because you get all this genetic damage and it's hard to undo that damage. So let's talk about prevention, which is all those years of smoking where you develop these abnormalities before you get the uh, um, actual invasive tumor. So cancer chemo prevention came on the scene 30, 40 years ago. Uh, this is a definition by Michael Sporn, who was here uh, many years ago, um, but is still active. Um, and it's the use of various strategies, natural synthetic agents, okay? So giving people something to suppress or reverse the process of carcinogenesis. So we're not talking about the tumor that's there, we're talking about the process that leads to these uh, uh, increasing 
um, histologic and molecular changes. So to regress those pre-neoplastic lesions, to prevent the development of new pre-neoplastic lesions, and to suppress uh, that which is already neoplastic, suppress their recurrence. And so the rationale for lung cancer prevention is based really on three observations, which is that we still don't think that metastatic lung cancer is curable. I gave you a 16% five-year survival, 15%. It's poor. We do know from other organ systems that cancer is preventable. So the breast cancer prevention trials with tamoxifen, raloxifene, now even the aromatase inhibitors, show us that you can prevent the development of a cancer in the contralateral breast in a breast that never had cancer to begin with. We can model this beautifully in animal studies in multiple target organs. And we also know that you don't develop lung cancer the year you start smoking, you develop it many years later, and there is this long preclinical phase with identifiable smoker populations, at-risk populations, where you can actually intervene. So that's the rationale. Now, if we could cure cancer, we would want to intervene when you've got the cancer, right? Uh, that makes sense. But we do know that the efficacy of interventions is better at the earlier stages of the process than at the later stages. You can cure a stage one lung cancer, you can uh, cure a stage four lung cancer. We believe, this is a belief, it's still a hypothesis, that the precursors which haven't gone through the basement membrane should be more curable than the invasive disease. And perhaps we can even uh, prevent the damage in the first place, um, the carcinogen induced damage by blocking uh, that damage. Um, but arguing against all of this is what I told you about the different driver mutations leading to lung cancer. There are many pathways, even in the histologic subtypes that we always lump together, like all adenocarcinomas. EGFR mutant are different from KRAS mutant, different from others. So we think the efficacy would be better early, but that actually remains to be proven. The toxicity of the intervention also uh, very much impinges on what you use when during the development of cancer and its metastases. Obviously, we give people horrible chemo and accept some level of mortality, death, from the treatment um, in the setting of disseminated cancer. We obviously don't uh, accept that in the setting of prevention. And the longer, the less likely a person is uh, to develop a cancer in terms of having a lower list, uh, risk, the less of a uh, toxicity you will actually accept. And of course, the person himself or herself will accept. Another thing to consider is the target population, uh, the size of the population and our ability to identify those at risk, right? There are many smokers, over 90 million current and former smokers in the US right now, but actually relatively few of them get cancer in any given year. And we need better risk prediction models to identify those cancers who are most likely to get cancer in a short term, short, short time frame. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about that. And finally, whenever you treat people, there's a cost. There's a cost for overtreatment, there's resources, psychological impact, et cetera. So when we want to intervene, uh, actually is a complex um, equation. But how do we move forward? So how do we identify agents? Well, if you know the mechanism, then that's the best way to do it. We know that HPV is the obligate cause of the vast majority, if not all, of cervical cancer. Therefore, the HPV vaccine is going to be effective, and we actually have some early proof of that with the uh, uh, prevention of the earlier phases, the uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasias. So you need to understand the molecular pathogenesis, and I submit to you that we don't know that very well for lung cancer. So we go to preclinical models. Um, there are many different carcinogen or uh, transgenic models that develop um, lung cancer. 
um, these models have been particularly good for studying um, colon cancer and treatment with uh, non-steroidals such as celecoxib, celindac, et cetera. Um, but you know, they're models. They are not fully reflective or predictive of human disease. Nevertheless, uh, they can give us some information. We also go to epidemiology. You know, are there groups of people who take certain drugs, interventions, whatever, um, and uh, seem to have lesser risk of cancer? Uh, this was very helpful in identifying, again, aspirin and colon cancer incidents, so the decreased colon cancer incidence and mortality. And actually, aspirin now is recommended for colon cancer prevention in a limited setting. And I'm sure you'll learn about that in the colon cancer uh, lecture. And finally, secondary endpoints from clinical trials, uh, including trials for other diseases. So identifying tamoxifen for breast cancer uh, prevention and actually raloxifen as well, uh, really came from initial observations that when uh, women had retreated for um, uh, uh, breast cancer, um, in an adjuvant fashion with tamoxifen, they had a lesser likelihood of developing breast cancer in the other breast. Um, or women treated uh, with loxifene for osteoporosis had a lower incidence of breast cancer. And so those kinds of analysis can be helpful. They've yet to uh, strike gold for non-small cell, but as a uh, broad uh, framework, that's how we identify agents. So the major issues then um, are how to get the right, how to match the right target with an agent to the process that is ongoing in the person at the time that you want to intervene. In other words, bringing precision medicine to, to cancer prevention. To adequately select the cohorts who are at risk, I'll talk a little bit about the fact that the squamous lung cancers, you have the precursor uh, lesion bronchial dysplasia, which is a pre-malignancy, or for the adenocarcinomas, the peripheral cancers, there are lung nodules that you can find on, on CT screening. So you can start to select cohorts. You need to balance the efficacy, what you think um, will happen based on your preclinical and such models versus the tolerability and major adverse side effects. And then you need to figure out how to actually do the clinical trial, which uh, is uh, actually not quite so easy when you're trying to prevent something that is going to happen at some point, but you're not quite sure when it's going to happen, and it won't happen in all of the people who are at risk. So those are the difficulties of cancer prevention. So I'm going to give you um, two, I'm going to tell you two stories of how we developed cancer preventive agents. Um, the first one is the inflammation story. It goes back many years, uh, 40 plus years, um, to animal data that shows that steroids, which suppress inflammation, actually can prevent cancer, skin models, lung cancer models. And the innovation from Lee Wattenberg in the 90s was that if you use inhaled steroids, which uh, you can actually get the same kind of efficacy in these lung cancer models um, in animals. And now there's something that you can actually give to people because no one's going to turn, uh, no one's going to treat uh, um, healthy smokers, healthy in quotes, uh, with systemic steroids, which have all kinds of side effects. There is some epidemiology. Uh, most of the inhaled steroid studies are negative, but most of them have been of short duration and not necessarily in people with COPD, but rather people with asthma who are not really at increased risk of lung cancer. There's at least one study, and since then there have been, uh, I think, more, looking at uh, a, v a veterans administration cohort, mainly men, who were treated with inhaled steroids for their COPD versus other agents, finding a hazard ratio of 0.39, suggesting that there is a, a huge suppression of lung cancer in those who got inhaled steroids. This is an example of an animal model. Okay, this is uh, using the uh, steroid budesonide, which, uh, and here what we see is that the number of tumors per mouse goes way down, about 80% suppression 
of the number of tumors, all, all, all types of tumors, uh, in these mice that were treated with a carcinogen, final carbamate in this case. And if you start to look at what are these tumors, most of them are not carcinomas. Um, most of them are actually adenomas. So not only do you get fewer tumors, but they're not as histologically uh, advanced. So in other words, you get many fewer carcinomas, even of the ones that, you d that do develop some tumors. So the question becomes, how do you translate this to human beings? And you do it by, um, the, so the studies that uh, um, did this um, started with looking at the prevention of squamous cell carcinoma by focusing on the precursor that occurs in the central lung, which is bronchial dysplasia. So this is just a slide showing this is your normal bronchial epithelium. Those are bronchi, bronchi are the airway tubes, so to speak, uh, uh, le leading to the lung. Um, and you get increasing grades of abnormality. This is squamous metaplasia, mild, moderate, severe dysplasia. You see that you have these darker nuclei. Finally, carcinoma in situ. And these lesions have a progression, a natural history uh, with a progression rate to cancer, which basically corresponds somewhat with the level of histological abnormality. So the low-grade lesions like metaplasia tend to regress on their own. Only uh, about 5% or so will develop into a carcinoma in situ. Whereas the mild to moderate lesions, again, still one, uh, one to two thirds of them regress, but some of them, a uh, slightly higher uh, number, tends to go on to invasive cancer. And once you get to the severe dysplasias, you have much higher rate of progression to uh, carcinoma in situ or invasive cancer. And when, by the time you're at a carcinoma in situ, so it hasn't gone through the basement membrane, it's not metastatic yet or invasive, um, the progression rate at the site becomes much higher. And studies following people who have bronchial precursor lesions show that about a third of them will develop cancer over time. So that's a pretty high uh, um, rate of um, progression um, over um, actually a fairly long period of time, although the median is about a year and a half. Uh, most, uh, many of these cancers can develop uh, over a long period of time. 40% develop from that abnormal site. 60% actually develop from other sites, and that's because tobacco gets everywhere in the lung. So um, that tells us that these bronchial dysplasias are both a precursor but also a risk model, a risk marker for the abnormal tobacco exposed field. And therefore, these are the folks you want to study uh, for bronchial, for squamous cell carcinoma uh, uh, prevention. So that's exactly what we did with our collaborator, Stephen Lamb in British Columbia. And here's how the study went. He screened 1,000 people with sputum looking for atypia. And out of these 1,000 people, about half of them had sputum abnormality. So in other words, you know, what you cough up. Um, and about half of those, 230 or so, actually underwent bronchoscopy to finally identify 112 who not only had bronchial dysplasia, so a histologic lesion uh, that you could see under the microscope, but also were willing to uh, go on to the study. Um, everybody had a, uh, a CT scan, a helical CT scan. They were treated with inhaled steroids versus placebo for six months and then underwent a repeat bronchoscopy. And the uh, primary endpoint was looking at the pre-malignant lesions, bronchial disp uh, dysplasias, the number of sites, the grade of these lesions. Um, the results were actually a little bit underwhelming. Um, there was no effect uh, on bronchial dysplasia. Complete resolution was seen in about 30% of both arms. Um, now, remember, you're going in with a bronchoscopy. You're taking a biopsy. 
and then you're looking at it under the microscope. And so for some of these lesions, you've taken out the lesion. So that's part of the difficulty of this model. But what you find here is that, again, complete response in about 30%, progressive disease in these high-risk smokers grew to 50%. Okay, so that's, that's pretty high. So we learned that inhaled budesonide is not a home run for bronchial dysplasia. An interesting um, sidebar to the study was that we were looking at CT scans, and we found that actually a larger percentage of the CT-detected nodules resolved with budesonide than with the placebo. So that led to the next trial, where now we could look at the peripheral lung, because we now have a low-dose CT, which can look in a screening fashion. And so here we teamed up with a group from the um, European Institute of Oncology in Italy, who had an ongoing CT screening trial. And so they identified 202 participants who had persistent small lung nodules and then randomized them again to the same drug, inhaled budesonide or placebo for a year, repeated the CT. And the primary endpoint here was the shrinkage of lung nodules. These are small nodules, can't biopsy them. If you biopsy them, you take them out. You don't do that unless you have a reason um, a clinical reason to biopsy. And so what we found here is, again, uh, overall the response was negative, but we started to look at the different kinds of nodules. There are non-solid nodules, which I'll show you in a second, partially solid nodules, or solid nodules. And what we found that over the course of a year, absolutely no change in the solid nodules. These are probably not uh, lung cancer precursors. Um, they're little we call them ditzels, for lack of a better um, term, but they're, you know, there's, uh, they're generally little fibrotic changes from prior um, uh, infections, what have you. The non-solid lesions, on the other hand, only represented, and the partially solid lesions, only represented about 30% of our participants, and there, there seemed to be some action that budesonide actually decreased the size. And when we took these people out to five years, because they were undergoing yearly screening, um, actually this difference became significant in that of, uh, the um, non-solid and part-solid uh, nodules continue to get smaller. They're actually very small uh, if you were treated by budesonide, but not by uh, placebo. Now, very few of these people actually develop cancer during this time frame. So these are interesting data, but not solid enough, pardon the pump, to actually go on to a phase three study. But they're helping us figure out how to do the trials. So what kind of nodules am I talking about? So it's something that looks like this on CT scan. It's not really dark, or I should say white in this case. It looks like the term is ground glass. You, you almost feel like you could look through it. Um, and these nodules, about quarter to a half of them are a lesion called atypical adenomous hyperplasia, which is a precursor, a known precursor to adenocarcinoma. And so um, what is the malignant potential of such uh, nodules? Well, those studies are only now starting to come uh, forward in the literature um, because uh, you don't generally um, uh, biopsy them when they're small. But here's one example of a trial uh, where 795 people with many subsolid nodules, in other words, ground glass or part solid nodules, GGNs are ground glass nodules, all small, relatively small, uh, some with a very small solid component, followed up with repeat CTs. And the bottom line is that about 1% of all nodules became invasive cancer, while another 6 or so percent progressed on. They continued to grow, so they were taken out at some point. And so about 6% were either uh, adenocarcinoma in situ or minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. So in other words, those earlier non-metastatic forms of uh, adenocarcinoma. So these lesions do develop over time but it may be a long time. 
and I'll show you an example. This is actually one of my patients, but also a family friend who wound up in the ER um, back in 2004, um, and uh, she had chest pain, so she had a CT scan. Uh, they were trying to rule out a pulmonary embolus, a blood clot, and in fact, uh, instead, they found this little lesion, ground glass opacity. She actually had three of them. So she went back for follow-up a few months later, and there it is again, not really much changed, and then didn't go back for more follow-up, as many people don't, um, until she wound up in the ER yet again with another episode of chest pain, again, rule out pulmonary embolus. Um, and what you see now, six years later, is a bigger lesion, still very ground glassy, so not a whole lot of growth, but clearly some. So this time she did go back uh, a year later, and now you've got a solid component. And this was a stage one non-small cell adenocarcinoma with adjacent atypical adenomas hyperplasia. So this is the time frame for the evolution, seven years before it became a stage one cancer. People like this have to be followed. So these non-solid nodules definitely have a risk of lung cancer. We've looked at it within the context of the, non, uh, the National Lung Screening Trial. Um, the bottom line is that those who have these ground glass opacities have uh, a significantly increased risk of having cancer years later. Okay, not at the time. These are not cancers most of the time. It's really a threefold uh, risk five or more years later. So these ground glass nodules some of them are clearly lung cancer precursors. So how do we put all of this together? Well, we now have a model, a clinical trials model, of how to do clinical trials, um, and that is uh, using these ground glass opacities and following them serially with CT scans. Here is epidemiological data taken actually from long-term follow-up of uh, people uh, treated with aspirin, for cardiovascular heart attack and stroke prevention. And what you see is that over a long period of time, more than five years, the uh, risk of all cancer death is decreased with aspirin, about a 20% decrease. And you can't see it here, but this is lung cancer. Uh, it's about a 30% decrease risk of adenocarcinomas. And so we are now taking the same CT uh, um, um, CT nodule uh, trial model and doing a similar study to our budesonide, taking asymptomatic current and former smokers who have these, not, this time only non solid or part solid nodules, and they're treated for a year with low dose aspirin or placebo, um, and then undergo CT screening continuing. Again, looking for effects on the semi-solid lung nodules. And to complement this, we're also looking at some biomarkers. Um, in this case, we're going even further into the early phases of carcinogenesis by asking the following questions. Smokers have huge changes um, in their bronchial, but even their nasal epithelium. Um, and their gene expression changes, which are more acute, some of which will revert once you stop smoking, others which don't. And so we're asking the question, if you give aspirin continuously, week on, week off, in combination with a different kind of drug called a 5-lipoxygenase inhibitor for there is good preclinical data, or placebo, can you prevent some of these gene expression changes that eventually would lead to structural damage and uh, cancer progression. So we're looking at the pre-malignancy stage with a CT screening trial. We're looking at the gene expression stage at the earlier phases in current smokers with this kind of trial. And next year, I should have these results, but not the CT screening trial result. They take longer. I'm going to tell you very briefly a different story, um, which also proves the point uh, about how to do these studies. This is a drug called myonositol, which is actually looks like glucose. It's a glucose isomer. It's actually a source of multiple signaling molecules, comes from the diet, has been studied somewhat uh, in a variety of uh, conditions. But we had 
um, beautiful data from, uh, again, Lee Wattenberg and others, showing that in multiple animal studies, you can inhibit carcinogen-induced tumors, um, especially uh, in including in smoke-exposed models, which are somewhat difficult to do. If you combine that with an inhaled steroid, you get even better efficacy. And most important, this is a drug um, that is generally reg regarded as safe, grass by US FDA terminology, which means that you can use as much of it as you want <coughs> because it's quite safe. So um, again, Stephen Lamb in British Columbia performed a phase one study to uh, identify the uh, tolerable dose, quite large, 18 grams per day and then looked at the resolution of bronchial dysplasia. Now, this was not a controlled trial. It was um, the resolution of dysplasia was compared with historical controls from his own experience, but 91% uh, of the uh, lesions resolved with myoinositol, whereas only about 50% of lesions would resolve um, in the historical placebo arms of his prior uh, chemo prevention studies. And what I think was the most exciting was that when um, the gene expression in the normal airways adjacent to these sites of dysplasia was examined, there was a clear different pattern in smokers who had dysplasia versus who were healthy. And with myoinositol, this pattern reversed, and it particularly reversed in terms of one particular signaling path pathway, the PI3 kinase pathway, which appeared to be activated in smokers with dysplasia versus those who did not have dysplasia. So it raises the prospect, can we do better in terms of identifying who are the people who we should target and specifically with this drug myonositol. So it's PI3 kinase activation, which is associated with bronchial dysplasias. Is that a better marker than looking for bronchial dysplasia? Certainly easier to get brushings than to actually do all the biopsies, uh, and you're not removing the, uh, with biopsies, you're not removing the abnormal sites. So it does give us potential to identify the right cohort. And also a new clinical trial model looking at the pathway effects as opposed to histologic effects, which could potentially be done in an easier fashion. So um, we tried to do this um, in our phase 2B study, which again, 448 smokers were screened, 332 underwent bronchoscopy, uh, eventually, 85 were randomized either to myonositol or placebo, um, and then we looked at the sites of dysplasia, and we also looked at gene expression. And what we found was that uh, in all subjects, there was a slightly higher complete response rate with myonositol, but also a slightly higher progressive disease rate with myonositol, which really came out as a wash. So we could not identify uh, increased resolution when this drug was brought to a longer term in randomized blinded study compared to that initial 26-person uh, uh, study that I showed you that was an open label trial. Um, it looked like it worked maybe a little bit better if the participant only had mild dysplasia, but this is the more reversible kind. So we did not get a good signal for uh, uh, taking this drug forward. Um, there was a trend towards decreasing KI67 labeling, proliferation, but numbers were fairly small. So it was a 22% decrease versus 6.2% with placebo. That was not statistically significant. There was a trend towards decreasing, not PI3 kinase, but down downstream of uh, PI3 kinase, AKT pathway activation um, with in the complete responders, but not in those who did not respond to myonositol. But that truthfully doesn't move us forward in any reasonable fashion. 
So this study also was not um, a home run, but it does give us a new way to move forward, trying to now gather all those omic technologies, which can hopefully let us further refine our clinical trials. All right, last five minutes, I'm going to talk about early detection in a very global fashion, okay? Because this is yet another way that we can reduce morbidity and mortality. But like everything else, nothing is simple or free. The issues that you need to be aware of with early detection is that what you're detecting may or may not be significant disease. What do I mean? The biases, lead time bias. So if you're screening for somebody, you may have earlier diagnosis, but the person will die at the same time they were going to die. You just know that they have the disease earlier. So your uh, survival appears longer because you identified it at a, at a smaller, uh, earlier stage, for instance, but you don't actually postpone death because your treatment is not useful. There's something called length bias, is that you're much more likely to diagnose indolent disease with a longer preclinical phase, giving you opportunities to detect it early. So in other words, better uh, prognosis, better outcome, but you're not detecting the bad actors. So this is well known in mammography, where the um, disease that is diagnosed in between yearly mammograms is the super aggressive disease that kills. And then the third uh, issue is overdiagnosis, that you're going to identify clinically unimportant lesions that would not have been diagnosed otherwise. They look like cancers, you take them out, but if you had left them in, nothing would have been any different. Of course, anytime you do any kind of screening intervention, there's morbidity, there's gonna be some mortality because you're doing things to people. And there's of course a cost. So for lung cancer, uh, how are you gonna screen? Well, chest X-ray is an obvious guess, right? Good guess. Um, and there were many studies that showed questionable um, uh, utility of chest X-ray until the PLCO, a large trial from the Division of Cancer Prevention, prostate lung colorectal ovarian screening. So there were four different screening modalities. This is the chest X-ray arm. People either got a uh, single view PA chest X-ray, usual care, no difference in uh, uh, deaths. Okay, so chest X-ray finally was buried once and for all. The advent of CT screening, however, uh, led to the randomized national lung screening trial. 53,000 plus smokers, all current and former, uh, fairly standard 30 pack year smoking. Uh, the amount of smoking is clearly relevant to the risk of lung cancer. Uh, hadn't quit that long ago. Remember I told you 14.5 years to see the uh, uh, difference in the lung health study early on. And they all had uh, CT scans versus chest X-ray uh, three times altogether. 24% of the CT scans were positive, which means that they had to have uh, further follow-up. Chest X-ray, only 6.9%. It's not a sensitive uh, A test. But here's the crux of it. 354 lung cancer deaths with CT, only 400 uh, and more, 442 with chest X-ray. So a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality, not just lung cancer incidence, but mortality. And in fact, this is such a big part of the smoker's mortality that you could even uh, detect it at the level of all-cause mortality. So let me show you this. So cumulative number of lung cancers, this is low-dose CT, this is chest X-ray, okay? The screening only went out to here, but you see that you still continue, you separate and you maintain that separation. And here's the death from lung cancer, chest X-ray up here, red, low-dose CT here. So a very significant decrease in the number of lung cancers. And this is now a recommended screening mortality. Of course, it's a 20% decrease, not a 100% decrease. Um, a lot of people get screened. Very few of them actually have cancer, so most don't benefit. So how do you make this better? Well, there are many different uh, studies ongoing. 
here's one uh, to try to figure out how to do this more efficiently. Who are the highest risk people who you really want to have undergo CT screening? And so here's one from the British Columbia Cancer Agency Group. Uh, they looked at a series of demographic um, and nodule type um, uh, uh, concerns and found uh, that they, uh, and developed actually a risk assessment model, which is right here, which can identify people who are most likely to develop lung cancer based on the nodule type location, et cetera, and demographics in a short period of time, AUC of greater than 90%, of 0.9. So this suggests that we can now identify those at the highest risk. So this is again being studied further to see whether we can hone the screening better. Um, but also potentially these would be the folks who we want to take to a phase three clinical trial because they are really highly likely to develop lung cancer in a relatively short time frame. All right, so that's pretty much all that I wanted to tell you. Uh, and I'm gonna sum it up all in one little slide, which is that Lung cancer has change, changed tremendously in the past 30 years. The progress is palpable. We now understand lung carcinogenesis, the process, much better. Precision medicine actually is applicable to a significant, still relatively small subset of advanced stage patients with clearly increased survival and now the hope of some really long-term survival. These are the early days of immunotherapy, but lots of um, potential there. We can now uh, detect some lung cancers early, uh, and that has clearly decre decreased mortality, and of course, morbidity as well. So as new tools and targets are becoming available, we're now starting to apply those for chemo prevention research, and uh, hopefully that means that next time or in a few years, we can even have some positives for chemo prevention as well. And that's pretty much all. List of collaborators, happy to answer any questions if there are any. Or not. So what do you think about all the uh, new checkpoint inhibitors? There are a multitude of them. <laughs> there are. Um, are they different from each other? Good question. Um, a lot of the differences are um, how companies have chosen to develop them. Um, clearly, they are hugely expensive drugs, and they have some real toxicities, albeit different, and in many cases, less than chemotherapy. So I think that um, there's a lot of development and the best use or the way to use them, it, it's really to be determined. You know, I think we're, we're in the infancy of this. And no, I don't think that they're applicable for prevention. They really are too toxic at this point. Okay, well, we'll move on. Thank you, everyone. Right. Give me the microphone. Oh, <laughs> the microphone that didn't work. Okay, fine. It works for the video chat. Thank you. Oh, changing the battery. <laughs> okay, so our next speaker is John Schiller. He was a graduated from the University of Wisconsin Madison, and then he got a PhD from the Department of Microbiology oh, yeah, at the yeah. University of Washington. I did a little bit, yeah. And he is came it, to problem? NIH in 1983, became a senior staff fellow, a senior investigator in 1992, and he's now chief of the neoplastic disease section. And uh, he's won numerous awards for his research, and it led to the development of vaccines such as Gardasil, which is used for cervical cancer. So we're pleased to have him. And uh, he's going to talk to us today about cervical cancer and the vaccines to prevent oncogenic HPV infection. John. 
Okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks for sticking around two hours in a row. That's that's a, that's a lot to sit through. So hopefully I can be at least a little bit entertaining here and, and talk about the HPV vaccines, which I liked what Eva said in the end, how, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. Well, I'm going to be mostly talking about prevention. Very little um, cancer biology. At the very beginning, I'll talk to you a little bit about HPV, its association with various cancers. But then really get into the heart of, of my talk, which will be talking about the prophylactic vaccines to prevent HPV, how, what their constituency is, how they're working. Um, and then with any type of prevention, the 800 pound gorilla is always getting it to work, getting people to take it. So I'll be going through some of the implementation issues that have arisen since we have this intervention, which is really frustrating because it could, could potentially save an awful lot of lives Probably with the absence of, of people quitting smoking, you can probably do more to prevent um, cancer deaths than just about anything we do. But unfortunately, it looks like to get people to actually take up the vaccine, it's going to be almost as difficult as getting people to quit smoking, which I never anticipated when we first developed this. So with that, let's get started. Oops. Can I use this one? Oh. Okay, so infectious diseases cause a lot of cancers, about 15 or 16 percent worldwide. And there's really three big ones. Um, barely work. Uh, so helicobacter pylori and gastric cancer, papillomaviruses, and a number of different cancers. And then the two hepatitis cancers, B and C, account for the vast majority of them. So turning to the HPV associated cancers, they, they cause about 5% of all cancers worldwide. And the big dog is cervical cancer, um, at least when you look at it worldwide, it's, it's, there's about 500,000 cases of cervical cancer. Almost all of them are associated with HPV. The other cancers you see up there, you can read them, um, have varying degrees of association with HPV. It's not quite 100%. In some cases, it's only a minority. And it's important to note that for cervical cancer, two types cause about 70%, HPV 16 and 18. And these two types predominate even more in these other types. So another point that I'll be um, coming back to at the end of my talk is that 85% of HPV cancers occur in low and middle income countries. So we really need to get this vaccine to those settings. Now 16 and 18 are important overall, but also no matter where you look, in various continents and areas, um, 16 and 18 is always the predominant type. So the same vaccines can work worldwide. Now the types that are three, four, and five can vary a little bit, but overall it's not a big deal. Um, the, essentially the same types predominate. Now if you look at the disease burden in the United States, it's a little bit different. And you can see here that if you look in gray that there's more cancers associated with men than there are worldwide. Um, and non-cervical cancers make up a larger proportion. It's still a minority, but it's a relatively large minority. And there's two major reasons for this. First of all, we have good pap screening programs, which has reduced the incidence of cervical cancer by 80%. Otherwise, it would be off the charts, even in the United States. Um, and the other thing is there's, there's been what's called an incident, uh, uh, an epidemic of HPV positive oral pharyngeal cancers over the last few, few decades. And so it's, it's, it's providing a much bigger burden. In, some, in, in the United States, about 70% of oral pharyngeal cancers are HPV associated. In some countries, it's 20 or 30% um, in the developing world. Now, phylogenetically, the types that cause cancer, mucosal cancers tend to, to be in this one area. Here's HPV and 16 that form two branches of the tree. Um, I'll briefly discuss six and 11 which cause about 90% of genital warts are over here. And various other ones are associated with hand warts, foot warts, or can be completely asymptomatic. Now HPV has a very unusual lifestyle. And the only place it can replicate is in a stratified squamous epithelium. And the reason for this presumably is because it can evade the immune system by never having um, a viremic portion to its life cycle. And so briefly what happens is in order to start an infection, it's got to reach this basement membrane and sit down here and then infect the cells uh, when sites of 
mild trauma are repaired. And then it sets up its DNA genome as a plasmid, circular plasmid in these basal epithelial cells. And the genes that are involved in, in these processes are expressed at low levels in these tissues. These are the parts of the epithelium that are under immune surveillance. But it's only when they become terminally differentiated and go up to upper layers of the epithelium where they aren't under good immune surveillance that you get high levels of gene expression, particularly the virion proteins, which the, the major virion protein is what the vaccine is composed of, are expressed. And so these very immunogenic elements are not normally exposed readily to the immune system because they're just sloughed off into the surface, into the cervical vaginal milieu, or if you have a hand or foot warp, just off into space where they can then infect somebody else. And just to show histologically what this can look like. So this is uh, actually uh, an HPV infection on the cervix. So you can see it's actually very you know, apparent, much smaller, not as, as proliferative as what we would see with a common hand or foot wart. And if you look over here in the non-lesion and have a marker for proliferation, MCM, you can see that it's limited to the basal layers down here. Whereas there's super basal proliferation in the presence of E7, I'll get into this in a minute. And then late genes, in this case, using it as a marker E4, um, which is actually a, a virion-like protein, is expressed only in these upper layers. So there's really complete separation between early layers and, and late layers in terms of expression. Now, we actually understand cervical cancer progression fairly well now with relationship to the HPV infection cycle. And if you look at, oops, if you look at low-grade lesions, which are called low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions by cytology, by pap screen, or histologically, if you take a biopsy, it's called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia grade one. This is just a manifestation of a normal virus infection. So for years, pathologists were looking at these, these lesions and not having any idea that what they were actually looking at was a virus infection. They thought they were looking at, at some sort of um, abnormality that was cellular in origin. But as you go up the disease spectrum, you get less and less terminal differentiation as you get to SIN2 and SIN3, and so that you get no more virus production. And by the time you get to cancer, there's absolutely no even virion expression. And so carcinogenic progression is as much of a dead end for the virus as it is for us. Um, and generally what's accompanied with carcinogenic progression, which takes, has to occur over a number of years, is you get high levels expression of two of the viral proteins, which are called oncogenes, E6 and E7, often accompanied by DNA, viral DNA integration, which um, derepresses expression of E6 and E7, leading to cancer. Now, one of the questions that always comes up is, is why do these viruses cause cancer? Now, I've already said that it's really an aberration of the life cycle. They don't want to cause cancer. But why do they have the propensity? Because they have this problem of, because of their tricky lifestyle, they want to get their genome, which is the DNA genome, replicated in the upper layers of the epithelium where the cellular DNA is not being replicated. So the virus has to fool the, the, the cells into thinking it wants to turn on DNA synthesis. And the way it does, oops, keep going. The way it does it is by expressing one pro viral oncogene E7, which induces aberrant proliferation. But this aberrant proliferation is also then a signal for the cell to go under apoptosis in a T53 dependent manner. And so it's got another oncogene called E6, which prevents this induction of apoptosis. And together, these proteins induce immortalization of keratinocytes and in the process genetic instability, which leads to cellular transformation. So both E6 and E7 have a lot of activities, but I'm just going to co concentrate on the, on the main activities uh, that we really think are critical for carcinogenesis. So for E7, the way it in induces autophase DNA replication is by inactivating T53, which is a cellular gene that's often called a, a, a tumor suppressor gene. It's often inactivated in non-HPV-associated cancers. Normally, it represses induction of S phase and going through the cell cycle by inhibiting the activity of E2F. Well, by E7 binding RB and in, in inducing its degradation also, it, it activates E2F 
to push the cell two cell cycle and proliferation. Now, the way E6 inhibits this um, is by interacting with anti apoptotic proteins, um, for instance, back and, and backs, but more, more importantly, by inducing the degradation of P53, again, one of the major tumor suppressor genes that are inactivated in many different types of cancer. And it induces the proteasome dependent degradation. Um, the other important thing that it does is that it activates HTERT, which is a catalytic subunit of telomerase, which again can, can promote immortalization. Now, biologically, one of the interesting features about cervical cancer is where it occurs. So these lesions occur all through the genital tract, but almost all of the cancers occur at a particular place, place called the transformation zone. It's called the transformation zone because there's a trans, because the tissue transforms from stratified squamous epithelium to simple columnar epithelial right at this point. Another word for this is metaplasia. And almost all the cancers arise at this point. Now, anal cancers also arise at the transformation zone. And HPV infection, as I mentioned, of the vulvar, vaginal, and, and, and penis are very common. But cancers of these are, are, are relatively rare, given how common the infections are. And the reason we think of this, this is the case, is because they lack, lack this formal transformation zone that seems to be specific, especially susceptible to carcinogenic progression. Now, the reason for this is not entirely understood, but it's a very interesting biological feature of the disease. And just to show you what this whole thing looks like, so this would be uh, the transformation zone here on a cervix. And this is looking down the woman's cervix. This kind of reddish area is a simple columnar epithelium, and the stratified squamous is out here. And this is an example of a high-grade dysplasia, a SIN3, that then can progress onto cancer. Um, quite frequently. So to look at the timeline of, of progression in cervical car carcinogenesis by HPV, so infections by HPV are very common soon after initiating sexual activity. But most of them go away spontaneously. So lifetime incidence is, is greater than 80%. So, so getting an HPV, a genital HPV infection is almost synonymous with being sexually active sometime in your life. Um, and most go away spontaneously um, which then el eliminates the risk of cancer. But a small proportion, less than 10%, um, are maintained and not lost. And these persistent infections by a high risk type are really the, the risk factors for getting first precancer, which usually takes about a decade, and then cancer, which takes about another decade to occur. So just to remind you about pap screening, so pap screening is what we, we call secondary prevention, where the infection occurs, you know, most of them go away, but if they don't and you start to see an abnormality, um, you identify it by a pap smear, and then you go through this complicated algorithm and with biopsy and then treatment of either precancerous or cancerous. And if it's low grade, you just go back and, and, and recycle this. And so what we're talking about today is what we call primary prevention, <clears throat> where you get away from doing all these complicated things just by preventing this initial infection by vaccination. So it's, it's a much simpler algorithm, especially if you're talking about implementation in developing countries. So the key to developing the HPV vaccine, and this we started this back in the early 90s, it's a few years ago now, is the following. So at that time, there was no sexually transmitted disease vaccines at all. So there's a lot of skepticism that, that any um, STI vaccine could work. But we decided to go forward with it. The number of people had tried to develop HPV vaccines. But the problem is when, when they looked in animal models with animal papillomaviruses, because papillomavirus infections are entirely species specific, what they found if they used denatured pr protein like made in E. coli or peptides, and they vaccinated an animal and looked at the sera for the ability to prevent infection of cultured cells or in animals, they found that they had almost no protection, no neutralizing antibodies. And so, but it was known that intramuscular injection of real viruses that were isolated from animal warts, um, which doesn't lead to viral replication, actually could induce protection against high dose experimental challenge in these animal models. Uh, but as I mentioned, injection of denatured forms didn't work. And so the key was really generating an immunogen that, that was confirmationally correct. 
Um, but the problem is there was no scalable source for authentic variants to sort of make an inactivated vaccine, like for instance, the hepatitis A vaccine or some other vaccines. And so the solution was when we came up with this is we just, it turned out to be easy. A lot of people thought it was gonna to be tough, but actually it turned out to be easy. So all we did is we took the major capsid protein and expressed it in this case by baclovirus um, expression vector. The reason we use baclovirus expression in, in insect cells is because there was that production system was already approved for at least clinical trials. Um, and it produced a whole lot of protein. And this assembly could maybe was, was gonna be driven by a high concentration. And what we found is that we produced this protein, just this one protein by itself, it spontaneously assembled into particles that looked like viruses, 360 copies of this one protein spontaneously assembling into these virus-like particles. So it's pretty amazing. But not only did they just look like a virus, but if we took them and injected them in, for instance, in, into a rabbit, they induced extremely high titers of virion neutralizing antibodies. But since they were not infectious, the only protein that gets, expo that gets expressed in these cells is this one, virion protein, not the oncoproteins. And so they were non-infectious and non-oncogenic. Um, it made a, a very attractive vaccine candidate. And despite um, the lack of evidence that STI vaccines could work, two companies, Merck and, G and GSK, took the leap of faith to move forward and they decided that they would try to develop this vaccine. We also at the NCI had sort of a parallel independent program of, of trying to, to clinically test the vaccine. And so there are now actually three different vaccines available. Um, the Cervrex is made by GSK and it just contains 16 and 18. It's made in insect cells, basically the technology we initially developed. It has a, a unique adjuvant, it's called ASO4, which in addition to, to simple aluminum salts, which is what's in most subunit vaccines, it's got something called monophosphorolipid A, which is a detoxified form of LPS, which is the first TLR agonist adjuvant that's been approved by the FDA. So Gardasil contains the same two oncogenic types, but also six and 11, um, which cause 90% of genital warts. And it contains the traditional alum adjuvant and they make it in yeast. Um, and then very recently, uh, Merck has come up with, with a second generation Gardasil called Gardasil 9, which also has, uh, in addition to the, these four types, has the next five types that are associated with cancer. I'll go over that in a minute. So it's just, it's interesting to look at the timeline for developing this. So we first produced the VLPs in 1992 and it took almost 15 years for the vaccine to be licensed, despite the fact that, um, you know, there were two companies, both of them, which were probably the two of the best vaccine manufacturers in the world competing to produce this vaccine. It's important to note that in parallel with this, there was a, a series of molecular pathogenesis studies case control and prospective epidemiological studies that just at the, the time the clinical trials were ready to start, there was a, a statement issued that HPV is the first necessary cause of a cancer, in this case, cervical cancer. But essentially, with, there was um, beyond a reasonable doubt that without HPV, there's almost no chance of getting cervical cancer. So this really performed the intel intellectual underpinnings to further develop and spend the, the hundreds of thousands or the millions of dollars it takes to, to, to test this in a clinical trial. And the other reason, it, it was very important to understand this process of going from an infection to cancer because we couldn't use cancer as an endpoint for clinical trials. And we obviously wanted the vaccine to have an indication of preventing cancer. The reason we couldn't use cancer was twofold. One, the trials would have taken forever because remember we're trying to do is prevent infection and it takes decades for an incident infection to go on to cancer. And the other issue is that in um, a trial with active follow-up, we would have to screen these ladies with pap screening and DNA testing. And when we found pre-malignant lesions that were high grade, we would have to remove them so that we couldn't let women ethically go on and get cancer in a, in a trial. And so for this, it was very important that it was considered, oops, that we understood the natural history well enough that by preventing intermediate and high grade dysplasias, um, we would know that we would prevent in, um, subsequent cancers. And in pap screening, if you cut out these lesions, you don't get cancer, okay? So that's a very good indication that they are the precursors. And the vaccines are remarkably effective at preventing 
in this case, um, SIN3, the most cancer proximal high-grade dysplasias. And you can see that if you limit it, the analysis to women having protection from the vaccine-targeted type and not having the infection when they started, you can see there was basically no cervical dysplasias that arose in the vaccinees. Um, there was also a very strong protection against genital warts in Gardasil, and protection in males against anal intraepithelial neoplasia in genital warts looks like it's somewhat lower. But we think the main reason for this is that we just miss more pre prevalent infection on the male genital telia than when we sample just at the cervix. Okay. Um, and so, although the trials mainly focused on cervical cancer. There has been some analysis of these other cancer precursors as well. So if you look at whether we get perfect protection against infection or intraepithelial neoplasia at these sites, we've been able to show that there's protection um, from infection by all these types. But we haven't been able to show protection against penile cancer because the trials weren't big enough and penile intraepithelial neoplasia is just actually relatively rare, much more rare than, 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 than um, cervical neoplasia. And so the trials are just not big enough to, to show significant protection. And for oral pharyngeal cancers, which mostly happen in the cons consular crypts, um, we've actually have never really identified the pre-malignant lesion. And so this, this disease is, is much less well understood than cervical cancer in terms of precursors. And so we can't find them and use them as an endpoint in a trial. So the vaccines are really good at what they're doing. But there are certain things that they don't do, and it's important to point this out as well. First of all, they don't infect, they don't prevent infection or disease by most of the other HPV types that cause 10 to 30 percent of cervical cancer that are not caused by 16 or 18. Okay, so the, we, we call them type restricted. There's, a, there's two or three other types that are closely related to 16 and 18 that we get partial protection on, then a whole bunch of, of high risk types where you see no protection. And the other thing, it, it's important to point out is that they don't in, induce regression of established infection or preventing these infections from progressing um, to further disease. So in other words, they don't act therapeutically. And this is why it's so important that, that the kids get the vaccine before they become sexually active. Because once they do, once they get their infections, the vaccine's not gonna help them get rid of the infections that they already have. So this is the data on Gardasil 9. So because the vaccines are type restricted, uh, Merck, again, when it decided to go ahead and increase protection from the, the two types that cause 70% to the seven types that cause um, 85 to 90% of cervical cancer. And what they found is that the antibody responses were not inferior to these types when they used this as a comparator. Um, but they also found 96% efficacy against SIN2-3 by the five additional types in Gardasil-4. So adding the types doesn't take away from the protection of the, or the immunogenicity of the types that are in the vaccine and gives you this added protection, which again will now increase the coverage from about 70% to 90%. And this was actually fairly recently introduced and this is just starting to be used in the United States. It was first approved um, just about the beginning of, of 2015 is now really just becoming widely available. I think they wanted to get rid of their shots and of the old Gardasil before they put out the new Gardasil. Um, so we think that this, this vaccine protects from initial infection. And this was really the intellectual hurdle um, when we first tried to get companies to, to buy into this vaccine, because no one could believe that you could get um, long-term sterilizing immunity from a, a sexually transmitted disease vaccine. Everybody thought, that you know, if you have an infected partner, you're going to get repeated exposures, and sooner or later, you're going to get the transmission. And so, if you get transmission today or six months later, and get cervical cancer when you're 46 or 46 in six months, from a public health point of view, it just doesn't make a whole lot of difference. So this is what they couldn't get their head around. But it turns out that we think that we get pretty much sterilizing immunity in everybody. We do see some things that look like breakthrough infections, but interestingly, they tend to appear early in the trials. So in the first six months or a year, we'll see some breakthrough infections, but now going out to nine or 10 years, after that, we see almost no breakthrough infections. So what does that mean? It means that probably what we're thinking are, are breakthrough infections is actually emergence of prevalent infection 
that was present at the time we vaccinate that woman and we just didn't detect it. And then it comes out and, and manifests itself so it can be detected after vaccination. So we think that antibodies are almost certainly the main immune mediators of protection for several reasons. First of all, there's high levels of, of, of vaccine neutralizing antibodies are routinely generated. I'll show you some data of this in a minute. And the cross protection that we do see mirrors the cross antibody mediated cross neutralization in vitro. And importantly, in animal models, we can take the, the serum from a vaccinated animal, put it in a naive animal, and now challenge that naive animal with virus that's got the serum from the other animal and get full protection from infection. Um, and the other issue is that L1, this, this major protein, isn't expressed in the basal cells where the infection is being maintained. And that's why we think we don't see any therapeutic effect with this vaccine. The target of the vaccine just isn't made in the cells that you would have to get rid of. So what's targeted on, on, on the virus surface is these variable loops um, that, are, that are different for each one. And these are all conformationally dependent. And that's made up of, of the, the actual epitopes are made up of contributions from generally more than one of these loops. And that's why um, simple peptides or denatured protein doesn't work for a vaccine. So one of the questions that always comes up is how does the, the, the antibodies reach the, uh, the, the, the cervix to protect? And I don't know why, but I always forget to mention <laughs> that this vaccine is, is administered in two or three doses intramuscularly. So in, during the clinical trials and up until about a year or so ago, it was three doses for everybody at zero, like one month and six months. But what's happened is that they've done some um, immunobridging studies. And if you're less than 15 and you just get two doses at zero and six months, you get just as high antibodies as a 19 year old will get with three doses. So by the time you go through puberty, you just don't respond as well to this vaccine or almost any vaccine. So recently it's only been another last month or so that it was, it was licensed now for two doses in the United States. But so the issue is we're generating systemic antibodies by, by inter, intramuscular vaccination, and we're getting protection from a totally mucosotropic virus that doesn't have any viremia. So how do we get protection? Well, there's two mechanisms, actually. The first is that um, in the cervix, there's what's called transudation of IgG antibodies. There's, there's a, an FC receptor on the epithelial cells called the neonatal FC receptor that bidirectionally takes antibodies and moves it between the cervical mucus and the systemic compartment. And so that we can generate a certain amount of antibodies by, by this process. But we think that what's more, criti more critical is the fact that, as I mentioned, in order to get infection, the virus has to bind the basement membrane. We understand this process. I'm not going to take time to explain it to you. But it can't bind, it can infect by initially binding cells. It first has to bind the basement membrane and undergo some funky conformational changes before it can infect the cells. And so that this would expose the, the infecting virus to a gradient of antibodies that are oozing out, exudating from the interstitial and capillary compartment at this site of microtrauma. And we think that this is the main mechanism because we can get strong protection against genital warts, uh, many of which occur on skin that aren't bathed in mucus. So the, the vaccine is remarkably immunogenic. It's the, like the most immunogenic subunit vaccine we have by far. And you can see this is just an early study where they looked at seroconversion rates. And it's 100% to a rounding error. Basically, everybody responds well to this vaccine, which again was something people didn't, couldn't get their head around. And the responses are remarkably durable. So this is some data from Cerberex that shows that the titers over time drop about a log or a log and a half in the first year or year and a half. And after that, they're absolutely flat. There's no difference. It bounces around a little bit depending upon which of the cohort comes back to be screened. But there's no difference at nine years than there was at two years in terms of the antibody levels. Um, and the levels plateau about 10 tenfold above the levels that we reach by natural infection. Now that's a bit of a straw man because natural infection, I've told you, it's just shed to the outside and so very few virions get exposed to the systemic immune system and so that the antibody response to natural infection is very weak. The important point is that this just seems like it's gonna go on and on forever. Probably what's happening is, is it's generating what are called long-lived plasma cells. 
which could, could, if they get a very strong signal, they go to the bone marrow and pump out antibodies the rest of your life. And this has been seen with real virus infections or live virus vaccines, but people didn't think that this could happen with a subunit vaccine. And the reason it does happen with a subunit vaccine is this looks like a real virus, okay? And we think that B cell recognizes this dense repetitive array on the surface as dangerous microbial structures. And this links, leads to cross-linking of the tyrosine kinases that are associated with the B cell receptors, which are just the immunoglobulins that are sitting on the surface of the B cells. And that this sends a very strong proliferative signal that leads to high dose antibodies and long duration in comparison to monomeric ant antigens, like for instance, diphtheria toxoid, which sends weaker signals, which actually continue to fall throughout your life. That's why you have to reboost them because they don't plateau. So uh, what I like to think of the B cell receptor as an antigen specific pattern recognition respect receptor that's specifically geared in to see this highly repetitive virus-like array. So we don't really know how long this is gonna last. There's now data out past 10 years formally, but since we've all reached this plateau level for eight years, it's unlikely that suddenly barring immunosuppression or something that the titers are suddenly gonna fall through the, tape, through the floor and drop off. So I'm actually very bullish about the idea that this vaccine is gonna give us very long-term protection. And if it only protects till a woman is 40 or 45, the chances of her getting a, a, an incident infection by HPV 16 and then her dying from it before she dies of something else are probably pretty low. So from a public health point of view, it may not be that important. So the most amazing thing we found fairly recently is so the, the NCI, we conducted our own trial our, our phase one trial, we made our own vaccine under contract, a GMP vaccine. But then we ended up having some problems getting them to scale up. So we used the, the, the Cerverex from GSK for a large efficacy study in Costa Rica. And you know we went back and forth as to whether it was worthwhile to do the, a public sector trial when two of the best drug companies were already conducting trials. But we decided to do it for several reasons. And one of the reasons is we knew we would look at things that the companies wouldn't. The companies only look at what they need to get licensure. And one of the things we looked at is it was, hey, what happens to those women who only got one dose? Okay, I mean, everybody was, they weren't randomized to get one dose, but some of them happened to get one dose. And it turns out in those women, they were, again, surprisingly, also got a stable response. So between six months and, or between 12 months and four years, there was no difference in antibody titer. And the titer only ended up being about fourfold lower than after three doses. For those three do those two extra doses, you only get an additive amount. And these were still ninefold above the level after that was seen after natural infection. And if you look here at protection against HPV 16 infection, persistent infection, nobody who got just one dose was infected. Okay, protection was 100%. And the confidence intervals are actually pretty pretty narrow, um, and they completely overlap the confidence intervals that are shown here for protection. And so we recently have some unpublished seven year data on this, and it turns out that after seven years, we still see no, one break, no breakthrough infections in the one dose and continued stability of antibody titers. And so we hope to follow these up for 15 years to really show that one dose can work. Um, and just to show that between four, after four years, the difference between three and one dose was about fourfold, and it's still fourfold. The same is true for 18. So it's not like one dose is now becoming less of, in comparison to three doses in terms of durability of the antibody responses. And if you look at the incident infections between year four and year seven, there's basically almost, like I was saying, there's almost nothing later on. What this shows is that high risk types that um, or other types that are genital types that aren't protected by the vaccine, these women are still being exposed to sexually transmitted HPVs. So it's not like they don't have risk factors or not becoming exposed to viruses. It's just that they're not getting these types. And the cross protection, again, is these are the types that we get cross protection. We're seeing pretty good cross protection here as well. So after seven years, it doesn't look like there's any difference between one dose and three dose. So why are we giving everybody three doses? or two doses even, I mean, this, we're wasting a whole lot of money. And the problem is that this is all post hoc analysis and nobody will change public health policy based upon post hoc analysis where, oh, we happened to look at, at this group of people and this is what happened. 
because people are always worried about bias. We try to look at bias, and there's no suggestion that there's different risk factors in the one dose versus the three dose, but we're not going to change public policy. And so we're going to have to go, we decided to go forward with a, a, a formal randomized clinical trial where there would be four arms. We would compare one dose versus two doses of Cervex, one dose versus two doses of Gardasil 9, um, vaccinating 5,000 13 to 16 year olds in Costa Rica um, per arm, a four year trial with long term follow up and looking at six months persistent infection as the endpoint. And we've already begun the pilot study. Importantly, uh, the Gates Foundation is helping to support this. So in some ways, being I'm, my history as a basic researcher, and I always hate to do experiments where I think I know the answer to. And you know, we're going to spend 60 or 80 million dollars on this trial <laughs> that I think I already know the answer to. But we got to do it. And I actually did the back of the envelope ca calculation. And if we would go from three doses to one dose in the United States, we'll save that 60 million dollars in two months. <laughs> So the only problem is the NCI is not going to be saving that money. We're not going to get the money back. We're going to spend the money, but we're not going to get back. But from a public health point of view, especially when I talk about what's going to happen in, in low resource settings, it's going to be a game changer if we can formally show that one dose works as well as three. Um, so to conclude the efficacy, so the VLPs are highly effective at protecting against the spectrum of anal genital endpoints from incident infection to high grade precursors. Um, and, and Gardasil also works good against genital warts in both men and women. But the protection is type rest restricted, consistent with protection being antibody mediated. And I should again point out there's no therapy. So get it before you become sexually active. Um, the duration of protection is unknown, but the strong protection at 10 years and now even out a little bit more after antibody levels have pl plateaued is certainly encouraging. Um, so now I'm going to finish up with dealing with some of the implementation issues. So hopefully I've convinced that convinced you this is a really good vaccine, okay? And the, the real problem is, is getting people to use it. And you've probably been hearing a little bit about this. Um, but the questions I'm gonna go over is who to vaccinate, how to get better delivery to, to adolescents, the effect of vaccination on screening programs, and most importantly, how to deliver to disadvantaged, economically disadvantaged individuals. So who to vaccinate? Well, clearly the main target has to be girls before they become sexually active because worldwide girls bear by far the burden of HPV associated disease and cancer, particularly cervical cancer. Um, but in terms of, of vaccinating young women, there's a, a decreased effect with age for two reasons, because the chances of being previously exposed and already having, for instance, 16 and 18 go up and then as women get older, the sexual activity after a certain point tends to go down, so the chances of being exposed um, become less. Now, as I pointed out, the male cancers become more prominent um, when in countries that have good cervical cancer screening. So this, is, this has been used as an argument to vaccinate boys. And so most countries actually don't vaccinate boys yet. The US is one of the few countries that do. Australia has started doing it and a few others. But in the US, the recommendation is routine vaccination of 11 and 12 year old boys and girls, and then vaccinate uh, females between nine and 26 and males between nine and 21, and um, MSMs um, up to, out to age 26. So what, what are the arguments for and against vaccinating boys? Well, the, the, the main arguments for are is you get this primary protection from male cancers, um, and also then hopefully help to get some secondary protection in women, some of the hard to reach women who decide not to get vaccinated if their partners are vaccinated will protect them. Clearly female vaccination is not gonna protect MSMs. And the rate of anal cancer in MSMs is equivalent to that of cervical cancer in low resource settings. There's this issue of gender equality that you just, you know, if you have something that can work in another gender, you, you, you need to provide it. It's likely to induce more rapid herd immunity and reduce the whole prevalence of HPV if we start vaccinating both um, uh, sexes. And then there's just the, the, the political issues. In, in, in some countries, it just may not fly to just vaccinate girls. We may have to do a gender neutral vaccination just to get the politicians to accept the program. So the main arguments against is it's not cost effective um, if there's high vaccination in, in girls because of this herd immunity of heterosexual males and I'll show you a little bit of that in a minute. 
And so it's just not cost effective. And so we really, which it's, it's a question of competing demand for other health, for health resources, and whether it's better to do this or spend the money but trying to give the flu vaccine to older people or whatever else your, your health limitations are, given zero sum game in virtually every country's in terms of their health cost dollars. So what about delivery of, of, of the vaccine? Well, it's really important to, to deliver the vaccine um, in adolescence because this is acquisition data in the United States and the UK that shows that within two years of becoming sexually active, about, about half of the, the girls have got an HPV infection. So that's really why we need to get this. It's really quite remarkable how common the infections are. And the issues of delivery are that in some countries they're doing pretty well, like the United Kingdom and Australia, where they do school-based vaccination. But the United States, the latest data show that we're about uh, a third are getting all three doses and about half are getting at least one dose. Now, I look at it a little bit different. I mean, most people look at this number. I'm actually, I look at this number. <laughs> I look at the single dose as, as a victory, um, even though that's not the official, you know. First of all, what I'm saying is, is my personal opinion. This is not the official um, dogma or gospel from uh, the NCI, but I look at one dose as a victory. Um, and a matter of fact, it's interesting that um, there was a report that, that the incidence of HPV 16 and 18 has dropped by 50% uh, in girls in the United States. And people are saying, oh, herd immunity. And I was thinking, no, just because we have 50% one dose coverage. Um, and so one of the issues is that in adolescents, if you look at other adolescent vaccines, diphtheria, um, tetanus, acellular pertussis, and meningococcal vaccine, it's, the, the, the uptake rates are much higher than they are for girls, even for the one dose. So something's happening that this vaccine is not being taken up like other vaccines. Um, administered to the same age group. And there's a lot of reasons for this. I mean, initially there was medical uncertainty at the time of FDA approval about the safety and duration of protection. But I think we got to get over this and we've had this vaccine um, for more than 10 years. It's not the new kid on the block anymore. It's an established product. Um, subsequent evidence of, of vaccine safety and duration of protection has come out, but it hasn't really seemed to make a huge difference in terms of vaccine uptake. Um, I think probably the biggest issue is provider hesitancy, where there's a lack of strong recommendation from healthcare providers, where they, they basically say, okay, it's time for your meningococcal vaccine. And then, oh, there's also this HPV vaccine that you can have it if you want it or not. You know, and it's just kind of be, you just become part of the routine that time for your HPV vaccine, don't discuss it, just, just administer it. Um, there certainly were pushback ep efforts um, from efforts, well-meaning efforts to make the vaccine mandatory when it was first introduced. Concerns about sexually, that, that the vaccine would promote sexual disinhibition, which has not been supported by published studies. It's also not supported by common sense. I mean, if you're not afraid of AIDS, HPV is not, is not on your radar screen. There was even an early study that was done where before the vaccine came out, there was a, um, a study that asked young girls whether, or young women, whether they'd rather have a herpes virus vaccine for genital herpes or HPV to prevent cervical cancer. Overwhelmingly, they picked the herpes virus vaccine. So they could have one, one vaccine because it's something they get. And whereas HPV cancers are something that old ladies get and they're not concerned about it. So this, you know, th this inhibition for HPV is just pretty much non-existent. Um, and so really the best argument now to vaccinate early is that it works better. You only need two doses. So it's really been a breakthrough that we only need to give two doses now. The, the FDA just approved it, as I said, a month or two ago. Um, just less than a month ago to approve two doses in, in adolescence. So that would really be the impetus to, to vaccinate people, kids young, not to have to say, oh, your, your daughter is going to be, become sexually active, so we need to vaccinate her at 12, okay? So that's going, I think, going to really help. But just looking at how, how well the vaccine works in vaccination programs real quickly. So this is data from England. So four to five years post-vaccination, where they got 73% vaccination coverage um, in 16 to 18 year olds at that time, you can see that there was a, a very pronounced reduction in um, infection rates. And this is data from New Mexico in the United States that was just recently published. And what you can see is that in the youngest group, there was a very profound drop um, since 2007 when the vaccine was introduced in the level of SIN, SIN 1, okay, low grade dysplasias. That are, that, and this is total not just associated with 16 and 18. Um, and in Australia, if you look at the higher grade 
intermediate high grade dysplasia, very substantial drop in the under 18 year olds, starting to be a drop in the 18 to 20 year olds, but no change in the older women who weren't being covered by the vaccination program. And genital warts, which is one of the first manifestations of protection. Because if, if you get a genital wart infection, you get the lesion really pretty fast. You can see that in the youngest age group under 21, there was a remarkable 92% reduction. And in males at the time when the vaccine was not yet being given to boys, in boys, uh, at least heterosexual boys, there was an 82% drop. Not unexpectedly, there was no drop in MSM. So what about, what is this vaccine gonna do to cervical cancer screening? And first of all, we can't give up screening because the vaccine won't help women who have established infections. I told you that before. Um, and be, being type restricted, there's still gonna be 10 to 30% of women who are gonna be um, infected with cancer causing types. And so we need to convince women to comply with program. And presumably, especially with Gardasil 9, because we will be preventing so many infections, there will be a change in the screening policy, but we have to let this kind of work out um, to see just what the impact is. But it, it'll be really important to, to, to modify screening programs because if you look at the cost of cervical cancer prevention in the United States, the vast majority of the cost goes into cervical cancer screening. And so that what we're looking at is presumably a shift from pap screening and it's currently underway to an HPV based cervical prevention strategy where we vaccinate at a young age and decrease this peak at an early age and then prevent these lesions or treat these pre related lesions by rather than using a pap smear, which has relatively poor negative predictive value. In other words, if you test negative with a pap smear, you still have a reasonable chance of having a lesion that was just missed. Whereas HPV has a much higher negative predictive value such that if you're negative by an HPV test, your chance of getting cervical cancer in the next 10 years is really very low, okay? Because we just don't miss HPV DNA the way we miss um, cervical abnormal, abnormal cells. And so that in many countries, they'll probably go to a very relatively small number of tests. In the United States, we test it, we do DNA testing, but it's every five years. But it's likely in the future that that'll be increased. Um, so now delivery to, to disadvantaged people around the world who, as, as I've noted before, 85% of cervical cancers occur in the developing countries. And there's actually a lot of countries that actually have formally approved the vaccine and says it's part of their, their vaccination program. Although you can see that there are important um, places like India and Sub-Saharan Africa where they don't have it. And you can see that these are some of the countries that have the highest rates of cervical cancer in the world. Um, but the main thing is that even countries that say that, that they approve the vaccine, that doesn't mean they're getting it. And this is some very recent data that shows the uptake of the vaccine worldwide. So it's in green is shown age birth cohorts in high income to low income countries. In blue are the portions of the, of the girls that are targeted, this is females in those, in those countries. And in pink shows the proportion of the targeted population that's actually getting it. You can see that even in developed countries, we're not doing very good. High middle income, worse, and basically we're not doing anything in the two lowest strata. And so this is really the, um, the, the, the issue for the future. If the only women who get this vaccine are the women who already have access to good pap screening, such that they have relatively low risk of cervical cancer, in terms of public health impact, the vaccine will have um, fairly minimal effect. So, ha but having said that, um, it was again recently estimated that we've already present, prevented by, by the vaccination to date, 400,000 future cases of cervical cancer, which you have to look at as a victory. But again, unfortunately, almost all of these are in the higher and upper middle income countries. We made almost no dent in cervical cancer, uh, preventing cervical cancer in the lower middle and lower income countries. So how are we gonna increase delivery to disadvantaged individuals? Well, both companies have committed to tier pricing. So for instance, um, PAHO in, in Latin America buys the vaccine for probably about a 10th of what we pay in the United States, which is 150 to $180. And Gavi, the Global uh, Alliance for, for Vaccine and Immunization, um, have been financing the vaccine to the poorest countries to the tune of about $5 a dose. And both companies have agreed to, to, to provide it at that price, which is a real breakthrough. 
And then one of the things for the future is that, is that we're, we're moving towards vaccine manufacturing in emerging countries, um, which is what has happened to the, H, the, the hepatitis B vaccine, which was $100 a dose when it was first introduced, and now is 18 cents a dose made, made for UNICEF around the world in India. And so a number of companies are moving forward with the HPV vaccine, um, companies in India, and particularly in China, and one company, Innovax, is actually making it in e DLPs and E. coli by some tricky technologies, and they're likely to have a vaccine, at least for China, on the market in the next few years. So that's very encouraging. And then, of course, the idea of administering less than three doses. I mean, if we could get down to single dose programs, this would really be transformative for the uptake. Because it's not only the cost of the vaccine, but it's also the cost of administering the vaccine that's an issue. Um, and so in many vaccine programs, the cost of administering is more than the cost of the vaccine. So with that, I'll stop. And if you have a couple of questions in the last minute, I just want to you know, acknowledge people in my lab who worked on this, particularly Doug Lowy, who for the stuff that was done in our laboratory was the co-PI and all these sort of studies. He's now the, the, NC, the acting NCI director. So we'll see after tomorrow whether he continues to be the NC, <laughs> acting NCI director or not. So with that, I'll stop. Thanks for hanging in to the very end. That was, yeah. Yeah. So, in, in the original trials, there was there were placebo groups, but there's something called crossover. So at the end of the trial, at four years, when the trial is officially over, you cross over and you vaccinate the placebo controls. So you lose them, okay? You can follow them, but they basically just have gotten vaccinated four years later. Now for Gardasil 9, and I, I skipped over this for, for time, um, because Gardasil was already approved, they couldn't use the placebo control because control, it was thought unethical not to give something that worked. So the control was Gardasil. So that's why they could only they could show immunological equivalency for the four types they had in common. They, and, and the administrators, the regulators said, well, if it's the same level of antibodies, it's gonna work the same because nobody got basically infections by those types. And so they could only do a comparator of the new types in Gardasil 9 versus the, the original four types. So yeah, they always have to cross over because otherwise it's not considered yeah. ethical. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question, and it's something that the CDC is, is right now grappling with, is what kind of recommendations. So what's known in terms of you know, the vaccinology of it is that it is safe. Um, Merck has run a trial where, just an immunogenicity trial, so if women have had Gardasil, you can give them Gardasil 9, and they, their arms don't fall off, and they get responses to the new types, very, you know, good, good responses. So that's not an issue. The biology is not an issue. The question is cost effectiveness. And uh, the CDC is, is really grappling with this. And I'm not sure what recommendation they'll make. Um, it could be that they recommend one dose, okay? But it makes a big difference because if they would recommend everybody get it, then everybody's health insurance would have to pay for it. You'd spend an enormous amount of money for just this little increment of, of added protection. So that's a really good question, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.